Telestream and Wowzer are extremely excited to bring you today's webinar, Slam Dunk, Stream Live Events Like a Pro. Our presenters today are Tom Preen, Product Manager at Telestream, and Chris Knowlton, Vice President and Streaming Industry Evangelist at Wowzer Media Systems. Chris is a passionate evangelist for streaming media who has spent over half of the past 25 years developing technologies that make live and on-demand media delivery accessible for companies of all sizes. A recognized industry authority, Chris was honored in 2011 as a streaming media all-star by Streaming Media Magazine, and he holds several patents for streaming software technologies. Chris previously spent 10 years driving Microsoft's media server roadmap and developing the core Microsoft media platform. He earned a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Michigan State University. For more than 15 years, Tom has created and managed digital content businesses and entries into new markets for technology companies, including Adobe and Autodesk. Currently, he is responsible for live streaming products and desktop video transcoding workflows at Telestream. Keeping with today's theme, Tom is also a Big Ten alumnus and graduated from this year's NCAA Final Four Heartbreak, the University of Wisconsin. Tom, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Ryan, and thanks for noting um, the Final Four result. Uh, I'll, I'll mention it later, but I have a special request into the to the Wirecast team uh, and shot clocks, uh, so we'll get to that later. Uh, and I'm very glad all of you could join us today. Um, I hope that you'll be able to take away some ideas to help you create and distribute uh, professional-looking webcasts. Uh, just a couple of words about Telestream. Uh, we've specialized in products that made it possible to get video content to any office audience, and uh, Telestream's customers are the world's leading media and entertainment companies, content owners, creators and distributors, uh, and the like. Telestream was founded in 1998 and is at the heart of every digital media ecosystem. On the enterprise side, which is part of our business, uh, it's used a, a lot in broadcast. Uh, for example, Telestream enabled the NBC Sports Group at the Sochi Olympics to, to quickly and encode and deliver 1,000 hours of digital coverage to 62 million unique v viewers. On the desktop application side, which is, is my side of the business, uh, products like Wirecast enable the booming live streaming phenomenon that we're talking about today. You know, so all in all, our, the media and entertainment companies that are our customers are BBC, CNN, Disney, HBO, ESPN, NBC, Time Warner, Turner Broadcasting, and, and many, many others. 95% uh, of top broadcasters are Telestream customers in one form or another. Uh, also, it, uh, Telestream has a broader reach than that. 80% of top Fortune 100 companies are also Telestream customers and literally millions of consumers. Uh, on the next slide, Chris, could you take a quick tour of Wowza Media Systems? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thanks, Tom. This is Chris uh, with Wowza Media Systems. Wowza Media Systems was started in 2005 when our founders recognized that online video was going to be emerging and growing as a medium but also that streaming audio and video was so complex that most organizations were not able to take full advantage of its potential. So we started with one goal, simplify media streaming and make it better. We've been changing the streaming media industry ever since. Our flagship, uh, flagship product is Wowza Streaming Engine, formerly known as Wowza Media Server. One of its best known features is the ability to simultaneously deliver multiple streaming formats, including several traditional streaming media protocols and five adaptive bitrate streaming formats. In addition, Wowza has also been filling gaps in the streaming workflow with Wowza add-ons, such as the Wowza DRM add-on for easily protecting your content, Wowza NDVR add-on for adding instant replay and seek capabilities, and Wowza Go Coder, an iOS and Android app that allows you to capture your content from anywhere and immediately distribute it live with Wowza Streaming Engine. Year after year, Wowza Streaming Engine has won industry awards based on continuous innovation and great customer support. It is now perhaps the most widely used streaming server software on the market, powering streaming for companies large and small across all industries, including many of the best known streaming service providers in the world, and some of the folks that Tom mentioned on the previous slide. So, how can our two companies help with your streaming projects? 
All right, let me pick it up here. Uh, the live streaming world is booming. Many of us uh, and many of you are trying to solve the problem of sharing a live event. And you're trying to add professional broadcast touches to it as well, to video productions for your company maybe, uh, for your coworkers or your, or your work team, uh, a partner company, your customers, or really anyone in the world. While we're using kind of a sports theme today, streaming live events of all kinds is really the main message we want to get across. Uh, Wowza Media Systems and Telestream's customers are not, not only enterprises and network broadcasters, but also uh, consumers, high schools, universities, businesses, and professional associations, those that are both expert in video creation and distribution, and those who are just beginning, and maybe that includes uh, some of you, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, as we go along. We'll, we'll try to uh, address a broad range of, of users here. And while video on demand is still the main deployment for streaming, live event streaming has an immediacy that you, you uh, want to capture and engage, and engage others. And our goal today is to show you how you can capture a live event with one or more camera inputs or other sources. Uh, and share that as a live stream to almost any IP connected device anywhere in the world. Live streaming is not always the easiest to do, but it's not rocket science either if you take care to understand the basics of creating and streaming your production. Telestream and Wowza can help, providing you with a powerful combination to simplify your streaming workflow from camera to viewer. And as we go through our, uh, our presentation today, we'll continually go back and forth with uh, showing you both the, um, the, the production and creation side of the coin as well as how it gets distributed and deployed uh, across multiple platforms. So what can I do with Wirecast anyway? Uh, we use a simple phrase in our marketing, plug in your camera, prepare your shots, and broadcast live. And we do that for a reason. Wirecast is software that makes a relatively complex process fairly seamless and within the reach of nearly anyone. Uh, and with Wowza Streaming Engine, you'll see how to, you can take that stream to virtually anywhere. So one of the most compelling features of Wirecast is that you can create professional live webcasts with only software and a fairly standard computer Although as we talk today, the more robust equipment you have and the better the connection, the better the result will be. And we'll keep going back. I'm sure that we'll hear during the Q&A uh, uh, you know, of a particular problem. And the answer is always, uh, well, it depends. It depends on, on your computer configuration and setup and the power you have, uh, other uh, external devices that may be attached to it, like video capture cards or, or cameras, and really most importantly, your, uh, your connection to the internet. Uh, but we'll get into all of that. Uh, Wirecast uh, can help you set up, uh, you know, as I said, a, a, uh, and create a, a, a production at a fairly uh, low, val uh, low cost, uh, it's cross-platform. Windows and Mac uh, are the platforms for Wirecast and you can stream to any device your audience uses. You can ca capture uh, other windows or applications on your computer or a remote computer now at uh, 60 frames per second if you want to. Uh, and I'll show some of these things in action during the demo we have. Uh, and uh, another thing is state-of-the-art encoding, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about the importance of encoding. But Wirecast 5 has added a new codec. It's called X264, which means you're now using less uh, CPU power at lower bit rates and at higher quality. We've tested X264 at about 30 to 35% savings of your CPU. Uh, H264, which is generally the standard these days, can, typ typ can typically tie up uh, 70% or more of the CPU. Again, this is one of the benefits, as I mentioned earlier, of being in Telestream's DNA and broadcast level technology and how it get, it's, works its way into a desktop product like Wirecast. Uh, some of the other things we've added, uh, strict constant bit rate, which I think we'll get into when we talk more about the distribution of video streams, uh, 
we've added it as a coding option I'll show you and uh, that that really enables uh, the stream to be uh, uh, a low uh, I'm sorry a, a low uh, action uh, stream to be ready to take uh, a switch to a high action during a sporting event or during a video game or something like that without loss of quality. Sometimes when you, and I'll explain how encoders work, when you're encoding a, a very uh, low action scene or perhaps a still picture and you suddenly jump to high action, there, there can be low, uh, a low quality hit for your viewers. Uh, as I said before, there are extended pro production capabilities, and I'll go through that uh, around Wirecast and how you can actually create a production. And uh, as I mentioned, Wirecast is both Windows and Mac. And Chris, I want to turn it over to you, and let's hear what uh, Waza Streaming Engine can do. Sure. Thanks, Tom. So I'll provide just a quick overview of what you can do with Waza Streaming Engine for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Uh, first, like Wirecast, Wowza Streaming Engine can run on multiple operating systems, including Windows, Mac, OS, and various flavors of Linux. You can deploy it on-site or on a hosted system from your favorite cloud provider, as we'll do for the demo in just a few minutes. The first task of Wowza Streaming Engine in the streaming media workflow is to ingest your content from a source location, whether a live source or a file on disk. For today's webinar, we'll focus on accepting a live stream from a Wirecast encoder. Once Wowza Streaming Engine has the stream, it can simultaneously convert it into one or more streaming formats for delivery to any IP-connected screen. The most popular formats now are Adaptive Bitrate Streaming, or ABR for short, delivered using the HTTP protocol. This functionality allows your player to seamlessly shift from higher and lower quality streams as local bandwidth and hardware conditions change. And it's used by almost every major streaming offering out there, from Apple TV to Netflix. There are four major ABR formats today, Apple HTTP Live Streaming, or HLS for short, Adobe HTTP Dynamic Streaming, or HDS, Microsoft Smooth Streaming, often abbreviated as MSS, and the latest format, a new and non-proprietary international standard called MPEG Dynamic Adaptive Streaming over HTTP, or more commonly known as MPEG Dash. In addition to multi-format delivery via both unicast and multicast, Wowza Streaming Engine can also provide numerous other features. A couple of examples include many forms of security and content protection, network DVR for a TiVo-like experience on any device, and trans-rating to create adaptive bitrate streaming from a single HD stream. On our next slide, I just want to walk through quickly some of the challenges that folks are, are facing and perhaps some of you are facing as well. Often when folks come to us and say, I want to do live streaming, they have already started out with a proprietary workflow system in the past, and they're trying to build on that or upgrade. So for instance, if they're streaming to the web, they may have been using Flash due to its popularity on websites. If inside a corporation or inside a private firewall or network, they may have been using Microsoft products, where they might have adapted Windows Media Streaming or a combination of progressive download and smooth streaming. Even older streaming technology might have been used to reach devices such as TVs and feature phones. And then IPTV applications, which are found in many homes along the home theater, alongside the home theater, in hospitals, on planes, trains, cruise ships, and in some corporations, are likely using yet another set of expensive streaming products. So if you need to cover multiple use cases or device types or environments, you may need to run two or more of these workflows in parallel. And this is even more challenging than just the idea of running them, but because each of these different workflows typically has a different encoder, different media server software, different player software, often requires running on different operating systems, and then you have to have either multiple management layers that you somehow are manually configuring separately, or you have to build yourself an abstraction layer that manages across all of those different platforms. So that's all a big challenge. Over the next few minutes, what we'd like to do is show you how Wirecast and Wowza Streaming Engine can eliminate these outdated parallel infrastructures and greatly simplify your streaming video workflow. So, Tom, do you want to walk us through the, the, uh, the workflow? Sure. I, I'll walk through the first couple of, of points. Uh, I think in particular where we get to the, uh, where I'm pushing out a stream from Wirecast. Uh, 
Step one is capturing your live events. As I mentioned before, it's set up your cameras. Uh, and you, you can uh, set up your live event capturing uh, both video and audio or just audio. And there are num numerous ways to do it. Uh, we're going to focus on starting with uncompressed camera and microphone feeds. Uh, step two, uh, that's rather a loose uh, label for this step since uh, this is all also where the creative juices start flowing. When the TD or technical director of the webcast, and there's a new title for, your, for yourselves now, you are now technical directors, of the webcast builds the shots, transitions, special effects, or whatever it'll take to make it a memorable and engaging experience for the viewer. Uh, and more on that in a few minutes when I show you how to do that within, the, within Wirecast. Uh, then whether the source content is uh, analog audio or video, it needs to be converted into a compressed digital format. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk to the, the newbies for a, for a second. For anyone new to the process, compression is a critical component of how video moves around the web. And the quality and type of codec, which is what Telestream's DNA is what I talked about before, the coding and decoding of a program, uh, the codec that's used is key. You, you should remember that motion video is literally thousands of still images or frames. Uh, running. Remember that booklet that you created as a kid with a progressive set of pictures you drew on separate pages and you stapled them together and then you fan the pages to make them look like they're moving, you know, and creating a little mini video, more or less a moving picture show. That's why raw video files are, are so large. They're essentially thousands of those still pictures. Uh, and you need to compress them in some way. And encoding software is very intelligent to be able to look both forward and backward from its reference point of the, of the frame it's on to, to make that, to do that compression or to not do a lot of compression because there's no movement in the scene, for example. Uh, and this is typically done with a dedicated encoder. Uh, and in this case, we're talking about Telestream's Wirecast software. Once the content is compressed with Wirecast, we typically push it downstream, uh, such as to a, uh, a WAUSA uh, streaming engine and, uh, or a streaming service provider that's often powering the infrastructure using WAUSA. We can usually push the stream using the RTMP streaming protocol, which will, and we'll actually give you an example of this in a few minutes. Uh, let's see, step three. Uh, is yep. prepare the, yeah, go ahead, Chris. You want to yeah, pick up there I, on step three? I think, I'd, yeah, that'd be fine. Uh, step three, you, you want to prepare the audio and the video in the WOWS streaming engine. And as I mentioned earlier, you can deploy this on-premises or in the cloud uh, on multiple operating systems. The most common streaming video and audio codecs today are H.264 video and AAC audio, which are supported in almost all the adaptive streaming formats and the media players on the market. Fortunately, these are what Wirecast sends over to WOWS the streaming engine by default, eliminating a bunch of extra conversion steps. Adaptive bitrate streaming requires you to create multiple quality levels of your stream, which the viewer's playback device can then seamlessly switch between as their local bandwidth and resources change. If you have lots of bandwidth between your encoder and your server, you can create those multiple quality levels using Wirecast and push all of them to WOWS the streaming engine. However, if you don't have a lot of bandwidth, perhaps you're pushing just a single HD stream out of a remote venue, then Wowser Transcoder add-on can help by transrating that single HD incoming stream into multiple streams at varying quality levels. On the delivery side, whether you're getting those, uh, delivering the streams directly to your end users right from your Wowser streaming engine, or distributing them via content delivery networks such as Akamai, Amazon CloudFront, or Mirror Image, you can select for multiple streaming formats to reach any device. To most simply reach the broadest screens, uh, uh, broadest range of screens possible though, we're gonna focus today on just two formats, HTTP live streaming and RTMP streaming. Tom, do you wanna talk about players? Um, sure. Step five is where uh, is enabling the consumption, and this is where third-party players come in. You can build your own player experience using exi existing technologies such as Flash, uh, Silverlight, and various mobile players. Uh, alternate 
Secondly, you can rely on third, uh, third parties to provide a consistent experience for you across devices such as the JW player or the Flow player. Uh, Waza works with most media players on the market. Uh, for the demo today, we'll focus on the JW player and you'll see that in, in the browser we use a little, little bit later on. Uh, JW player is most typically used with Apple HTTP live streaming format. Uh, which generally provides a very good playback experience. Uh, the player can also automatically roll over to RTMP streaming when the user's device uh, or browser does not support HLS. So that's, the, that's kind of the big picture of live streaming workflow. Uh, let's talk about um, and a, uh, how all this works together. Uh, and uh, we have a case study that we want to touch on, uh, a business called High School, High School Cube, and maybe you've, you've seen it. Uh, they have some pretty impressive growth in the past year. They're only about 16 or 18 months old. Uh, high School Cube provides high schools and their students with a platform that, that's very simple to broadcast their events live in HD for free, uh, record to the cloud, create highlight clips. It, it's very easy to do that if you, you can be watching a stream and, and literally just clip out what you want. Uh, some fun facts about High School Cube, they have over half a million cubes created. These are local channels uh, that have been created mainly in North America uh, for anyone to watch, share, and broadcast to actually. And uh, I've joined two cubes, uh, one for, for the local cube here uh, in the town where I live, and also uh, my, uh, the school that I went to uh, back in Wisconsin. Uh, last year, in the past 12 months, I should say, they broadcast live uh, two and a half million minutes. Uh, they featured 1.2 million students. They've shown 8,612 touchdowns. I guess they counted them all. 287,170 baskets during basketball games. Uh, 12,000 instruments played. 13, 13 million students, families, uh, and fans entertained by uh, by their their platform. It, it's quite an interesting uh, example. Of, of a live streaming business. So let's uh, let's stop here. Um, I think this is where the, a little bit of the fun be, begins and I'm going to show you how to set up a, a, a webcast and Wirecast uh, and then I'm going to show how you can publish an output to destinations from Wirecast including High School Cube and Wowza. So let's move to that. All right. Here you're you're taking you're looking at the uh, Wirecast uh, UI, and it's uh, the way it's set up is that there are two uh, two panels at the top that are uh, displays. The one on the left, where the the cursor is, is the preview screen and the green light. The one on the right is the live screen and the red light, and you can start to set up your your production. Uh, in that, in this way. Now, let's say, for example, that uh, I've uh, uh, I'm have I'm going to start broadcasting a high school tournament, but it, but I also prior to this I'm going to be showing a movie, let's say, and uh, I want to push live a little bit of a teaser coming up next, high school basketball. Uh, and while this is showing, I might start to put together um, my my broadcast. So right now, I I've got something was well, a sports group. I don't like that especially, and I've got oops, I've got scores and lowlights. So I want to change uh, the uh, the text that I have in the lower third, and I can do that fairly easily. And I want to call it the Wowza Sports Network. I'm 
raising you guys to network status, Chris, and I'm going to, rather than low lights, I want to show highlights of the game. And you can see it's it's changed dynamically. And uh, the movie's over, and I want to push my uh, the beginning of my show. So I've also, uh, I have a couple of webcams running, nothing fancy today. Uh, I've got actually a, a Mac with a FaceTime uh, camera running right now showing my face, and I also have uh, a, uh, a Microsoft web webcam over on the side, so you can see our studio here in the Sierra foothills in California. And I'm ready to, to uh, start my broadcast of the game, and I'm giving you a little bit of uh, background of what's what's going on uh, or what will be going on during the game and who the opponents are. Uh, and uh, at this point, I want to make sure that uh, I have uh, things set up the way I want them set up for uh, when I push the game live itself. I don't like that lower third. Let's see, do I like the that lower third with the game or that lower third? I think I'll go with that one. Uh, so I'll start to push it live. And you'll start to see the game, and, and this is what you will see in, a, in just a couple of minutes on the web. Uh, just to run through a couple of other parts of the uh, Wirecast UI to add, uh, shots, it's very easy, it's just on layers. Uh, also, just bear in mind, and you can see how I've set up the layers on Wirecast, it's very easy to set up. It, it's a layering system, not unlike other types of programs you may have used that have layering systems like Photoshop. Uh, and on the top layer, I've set up my lower thirds and kind of some informational things. On the second layer, I've set up uh, the the in-studio cams for me, the promotional, uh, the promotional PNG that I that I uh, showed before, and the video that I was showing prior to the game starting. Uh, I also through through various menus uh, can also add shots, rename, edit shots. Uh, push things live, I can reconfigure the uh, layout so I get rid of the preview, although it's really helpful to have the preview so I know what I'm setting up, although once the game's going, it, it may not make that big a difference. Uh, I've set up some encoder presets uh, that we, sh we should take a, a very quick look at. Uh, we have, as I said, literally uh, hundreds of, a couple hundred encoder presets of all types for uh, for uh, several types of, of uh, content uh, distribution network CDNs that we work with. You can also set up your own. In this case, uh, our, uh, we've set up a uh, RTMP flash uh, stream. This is at 720p and you, you can see the various uh, encoder settings that I have, I can change them all if I want to, uh, if, if my quality is suffering in any way, I can uh, I can change it. Uh, ideally, I would change all that before going live so that uh, the live uh, experience for the viewer is not affected. Uh, and we've done a couple of other things like add uh, constant bit rate, strict constant bit rate and keyframe alignment for CDNs to better align uh, and deliver uh, video uh, at adaptive bit rates for uh, different types of, of devices from smartphones to tablets to computers or set-top boxes uh, or whatever it might be. That's a real quick run through of what, uh, what uh, Wirecast is like. I'm uh, in setting up a show. Now I, I want to make sure that I can get this out to the internet. Uh, and uh, I'm setting it up uh, right here. I've set it up to, to stream to a Wowza server. 
And at this point, I want to turn uh, control over to Chris, and he'll walk you through the Waza streaming engine. Great. Thanks, Tom. Ryan, while we're doing that, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, I do want to point out that we encourage all of you to submit questions via the questions panel. Um, we see a lot of them have been coming through, and we're trying to answer most of those um, as they come in. We will address a lot of them during the live Q&A session at the end. If your question is a, a little bit more detailed, then we'll have to follow up offline individually, and we'll be going through those and trying to get to as many of those as we can. But uh, I do encourage you to keep submitting those questions, and we'll try to address as many of them as we can during the Q&A at the end. I'll pass it back over to you, Chris. Great, thanks. Can you see my screen all right? Yep, we can see it clearly. Perfect. Very good. All right, well, what I'd like to do is um, walk you through what we're doing today is Tom's taking that stream and he's pushing it out to a Wowza streaming engine, which happens to be running in the cloud. And I thought it would be interesting just to show you how we set that up. Uh, so it's running on Amazon Web Services uh, and pushing out through CloudFront distribution, so it's HTTP delivery. And so to set this up, the easiest way I always find is just to type in Wowza and CloudFront in your favorite search engine. And the first uh, hit you get is always the article from uh, the Amazon team that was written with help from the Wowza team on how you actually deploy Wowza streaming engine in the cloud with CloudFront built in, uh, the CloudFront connections already built in. And so last night, uh, I went through and set this all up just so that we knew everything would be working before the webinar. And they have 10 basic steps here, which you can see in this area. Oop. Let's try that again. In this area, like so. And um, fortunately, once you've gone through the 10 steps, it takes about 10, 15 minutes the first time, probably. Uh, once you've done it a few times, it's pretty easy just to hone in on one step since you already have the account, which is creating a cloud formation stack. And so I did this, and let me show you what I did here. I happen to be in the Pacific Northwest outside of Seattle, and so I went ahead and set up a stack in U.S. West, the U.S. West region. Uh, that's where Amazon has a data center here with CloudFront running in it, and their EC2 instances. And so I set that up following the instructions here. And then on the next step, this is all step by step, so it's, it's pretty easy for you to go walk through each step in succession. You don't have to go back to that first page and click on each URL. And so I set it all up and launched an instance. And then I'll, here, this is, where, this is the page that says, here's how you verify that everything's running. Um, but the key thing is they, they send you off to the cloud formation panel at this point, the console. And so uh, I'll zoom in a little bit. And I have this Telestream while a webinar stack that I set up last night. And I can click on that and get a little bit of information about what I actually set up there. Uh, let me scroll this up so you can see a little bit more. And so it says that uh, my, my creation of the stack is complete. I had that all completed. And then the key thing on this page is there are a set of outputs here. <clears throat> roll this up even higher. And what I like about this page is that you get all this information here on the left. You get playback URLs that you can just drop into your player. You get uh, the, the Wowza Engine Manager URL, which takes you into our new web-based admin console. Uh, so a lot of useful things here that you can use to get into the server. Um, what I'll do is uh, I would click on this link here this is what you would see if you've already signed in, as I have in the past. I'm going to change this URL just a little bit so you see what the first time user experience is for any of you who are new to this. Go ahead and type this. This is what you get the first time you go in. It's just sort of the, you know, welcome, yes, it's running. You, you found the right place. You are at the web-based admin console for Wowza Streaming Engine. And then it explains how you can take an input from any device there on the left, including encoders like Wirecast. Uh, push them into Wowza Streaming Engine and then output to any screen. And really the heart of what we do with Wowza is this section in the middle. And it's, it's all about applications, and those applications are really a, a set of configuration settings. Uh, if you happen to be coming from a Microsoft world, you may be used to calling this something more like a publishing point. Um, but the idea is that you have a set of configurations or a, config a set of settings, if you will, that explain where you're pulling the content from, what you're doing to it, what protocols you're using, how you're converting or processing it, and in which formats you're pushing it out uh, and, and to where you're pushing it. 
and then it prompts you to log in. I will go ahead and log in. Uh, if you have not yet set up a publishing username and password uh, as a first time user, it prompts you to do that here and that's what you type in uh, on the encoding side in order to get authentication to go ahead and push a stream to the server. So you're not just taking in random streams from anybody. Uh, we already did that <clears throat> and I'll explain that as we go. And then it takes you into the, the home page of Wowza Streaming Engine. And at a start, what it does is it, it gives you some really high-level information. How many people are currently connected to your server? We're the only ones using this, so it's, it's nobody at the moment. Uh, there's this usage graph in the middle, which can be pretty handy at a glance. You can see the health of your server. We happen to be running on an M1 large, or sorry, an M3 large EC2 instance, so we've got plenty of bandwidth and, and power to spare at the moment since it's just me as a single user. It also gives you information about what kind of license you're using, what kind of add-ons you have enabled among the premium add-ons that I mentioned earlier. It also gives you a test player right on the home page so you can click on this button uh, and get a test player that pops up and shows you that you've actually installed everything correctly and that you can actually get a stream from this cloud instance. On the server side, let me go into just real quick into what the server page does. While we're waiting here, I'll just refresh the page. Hit it again. On the server side, you get information again about the server and server settings. Probably the most interesting one for a lot of folks is this new server monitoring page, which shows you current usage, a lot of the, the, which is basically a larger version of the chart we saw on the first page, number of connections, how much bandwidth usage you're using, incoming and outgoing, so you can get a sense for that, what the CPU is doing, how much memory you've used. Uh, and total disk space available. And you can also dive into any of these graphs uh, at a pretty granular level from the last hour to the last 365 days uh, using the drop downs, or you can just do a drag and drop or operation and dive into just that region that you spanned uh, visually. But for our purposes today, let's go to live applications. I have a live CloudFront application running. And because this is going out through HTTP distribution over CloudFront, the way we have it set up is um, with these playback types you see here, MPEG Dash, Apple HLS, Adobe HDS, and Microsoft Smooth Streaming. Um, and you can change that through the, uh, the edit button here. Uh, what we're really looking for today is that connection with Wirecast. And so this is the current homepage for incoming publishers. And what it provides is a bunch of settings that you would use with your encoder if you wanted to manually type those in. But uh, what we'll have coming out soon, and which we recently showed at the National Association of Broadcasters, or NAB show in Las Vegas last month, was a new uh, a, a version of that UI coming out, which not only allows you to manually get the information, still over here on the right-hand side, but also allows you to choose uh, your favorite encoder, in this case Telestream, and um, get uh, all the information that you need here as far as the host and port and stream name. And not only get it, but even better is you can download a configuration file. So right here. So you can have everything set. You can download a little XML file. I could then send that over to Tom. And in fact, what I did yesterday was just send him the information so that he could plug it in. So this will be available soon, so it makes it much easier to go ahead and, and just really configure things more simply than having to type, thing, type things in and worry about fat fingering a, an IP address or something. So let's go back to our, our EC2 server, which is running and doesn't yet have that new UI. And so Tom has gone ahead and uh, published his stream from Wirecast to us, and if we go into incoming streams here, we do see that stream coming in right here, and it's active, which is great. There is a, uh, over here on the right, you see this actions. That's actually a, uh, a button that allows us to go ahead and start recording if we wanted to. So you could record it on Wirecast, sort of uh, source of, of truth if you want to do it locally. If you want to also be able to save it or record that stream in the cloud, you could do that as well. So that you could immediately go into VOD or post-production mode on it as soon as the recording's done. And then what we'll do is go into this test players button up in the upper right and just see that stream coming in. 
And what we'll get first is an RTMP page that says not enabled because it, you remember earlier I showed you this particular configuration only has the HTTP protocol adaptive bitrate formats running because we're running it out through CloudFront over HTTP edge servers. So this isn't enabled. We do have MPEG dash enabled, HLS is enabled, but I'm not watching it on a Mac uh, client, so our HTML5 client that can play back HLS, so we don't have that shown here. Uh, could do Apple HDS. In fact, let me go ahead and start the stream, show you what that looks like. We have the stream coming in, which is perfect. Uh, we could also do it with smooth streaming. So you can see all the multiple formats are working. What we want to do now, though, is take, uh, this is, let me show you what this looks like a little bit closer here. In the test players box, we have a mobile tab, and on the mobile tab, because obviously we're not on a mobile device, uh, we could just take this URL and we can copy it and paste it into a, uh, into a device. Or uh, down here below, you see there's this area where I can just send this to myself in the form of an email and then open up that email on the device and click the link and start playing. If I happen to be running, because this is a, a responsive uh, web design UI, uh, this console, I can actually open and administer my browser streaming engine completely from a mobile device. I could be on a tablet doing this, in which case I could just click on these links directly. But in this case, let me copy this link. And what we're going to do now is make this a little bit more usable. Our test players aren't very usable. They're pretty plain. They, they're not really made for uh, any robust customization or anything. I'm going to go over to uh, JW Player. As we mentioned earlier, we, we would use this for our demo. And I have an account here, and I'll go ahead and sign in on the JW Player site and click on Publish. And what it asked me to do here is just enter a few pieces of information to get my stream going live. And so the first thing it asks for is a URL, and in this case we're going to pull in that HLS URL and just plop it in there. And also then it asks you if you want to put in an image, and I happen to have an image ready here that I can put in sort of for my... Uh, my thumbnail image uh, when we're not actually watching the video on the player and then I can enter a title and then I can publish the video and what we get now is a, a sample player here configured the way we want we could go ahead and choose a different skin or choose some different information here including whether our primary playback is HTML5 or Flash uh, I could choose Google Analytics, could do some other interesting things, but really we just want to go ahead and make sure that this thing works. So I'll click on this. There's our live video playing in a JW player. It's not very useful when it's on the JW player site though, so I'll pause that and scroll down and this red button down at the uh, lower right is the get embed code button. So I'll click on that and what you see here is all the embed code necessary to just plop this into a web player on your page. So take a web page that you have, put this code in, in the head and in the, in the body of the page in the HTML, and suddenly you get that same JW player showing up on your website uh, with all the great benefits. And so I did that. I took this and I, I sent it to Ryan, who's moderating today, and he has dropped it into a uh, page on our site. So let me bring that up. <clears throat> And here's the page that Ryan created, and then uh, here's the, the same uh, embed code got uh, dropped onto this page, and now we should be able to see, if all goes well, there's our basketball game. So from basically we've gone from Wirecast to Wowza Streaming Engine to JW Player, dropped it onto a web page. So you can see sort of real life how you can go that end-to-end -end workflow, and this page could be showing up on a mobile device, on a desktop, what have you. So I think we've covered most of the key things here. Let's go back to uh, our demo uh, slides. And then Tom, why don't you walk us through the summary and, and keep us going through the slides. All right. Uh, Uh, just a second. Actually, Chris, if you could sure, take, I'd be happy to take the first couple, and I'll take the yeah, absolutely. So the first step, I mean, at the high level, is just walking through sort of what Tom mentioned at the beginning, the the mantra of you plug in your cameras, um, which is basically what we showed you. He showed you that he had a few cameras plugged in, and he had some other. He had a live feed coming in, um, and some other uh, some on-demand content that he had that he could feed in. 
Uh, he prepared a number of shots and showed us how he did the, the titling and everything on top of that and got all those shots ready. And then we pushed it. He, he, he sent that stream out as a uh, stream to a Wowza streaming engine running on AWS from the information I sent him. And then in the final step, uh, we put it into a JW player, which can now be viewed on almost any screen, and you can see that playing back. So we have that whole end-to-end -end workflow. And so that's that's it in a nutshell. So let's let's take a look now at some next steps. All right, why don't I pick it up there? Sure. Uh, I can do the so, first part, and you can do the second. It, <laughs> okay, why don't you do that? <laughs> so, Go so we it. have a, we have a couple of things here. One, we have some uh, some offers, basically. So, we you know we we appreciate that you all came and attended today. Uh, and, and we still have lots of time for Q&A, so don't go anywhere yet. Um, but, but in appreciation for your interest, we'd also like to offer you some discounts to help get you started if you're not already using Wowza and Telestream together, uh, like High School Cube is doing. So the first is uh, with Wowza, we have a 10% off uh, for one year from our, from our subscription model. Uh, so you get 10% off. And included in that is six months of the network DVR, that TiVo-like functionality so you can do instant replay, you can stop in a live stream, you can seek in a live stream. Um, so six months of that included for free and then you have the coupon code here which is good through the end of the year. And then Tom? Sure, uh, also in, in, to help you get started with with uh, live streaming and webcasting, uh, we have a discount for Telestream Wirecast. Um, go to telestream.net uh, and that's a 10% off new purchases of either Wirecast Studio or Pro. There are two levels to, to Wirecast. Um, the Pro product has uh, most of the things that I showed you uh, during the demo, uh, and the and Studio has a few uh, a few less features, uh, including scoreboards, for example. If you're doing sports, you'd want the Pro version. Uh, but anyway, there's a 10% uh, discount off of those, and there's the, the coupon code that you can use, and it expires on June 30th of this year. So I think it, we're to uh, the Q&A. Uh, final thoughts. Uh, thanks for spending time with us today. Uh, it, it's been almost a 50-minute presentation by us. And we have, an, and we'd sure like to, to address some of your questions. I know we have a couple of, of uh, technical specialists on both sides, on Wowza well, and, and the Wirecast side, answering your questions in chat, kind of dynamically as we've been going along. Uh, and we'll be able to address a few more in the in the final 10 minutes. Um, and we'll send you a follow-up uh, email uh, with more information about both the products and the process of live streaming. Uh, and you can follow-up questions tomorrow or, or the next day if you have some other uh, pressing concerns you can contact us at our support uh, emails and our technical support emails. So I think Ryan and Chris at that point maybe we should open it up for for Q&A. Sounds great Tom thanks so much and uh, we, you know, we do have those codes that we'll be sending out in a follow-up email so that you guys can get those discounts on the Wazza streaming engine as well as on Telestream Wirecast Studio or Pro. So look for that. And we'll also be including the recorded version and the slides of this presentation in that follow-up email. So look for that here in the next couple of days. So we've had a slew of questions come in during the webinar. We've tried to answer as many of them as we can. But I have several that I kind of picked out that I thought were a good topic um, kind of for general, general digestion. So... You know, one of the questions I have here from David was, when you say cross-platform, are you referring to the client? Um, and if yes, are you know, you're trying to reach iOS devices as well as traditional Windows and Mac PCs? And I guess to answer that question, you know, you know, we do have the support on the Telestream side for both Mac and PC from the production perspective. And then that's where Wowza kind of fits in to be able to take that one stream and re-encode to all these different or repackage to the broadest range of devices, whether it be iOS devices or Mac or PC or your TV or internet-enabled TV. Um, do you have anything you can add to that, Chris? No, I think that about covers it. I mean, that's that's really one of the key things that has made Wowza rather successful in the market is the fact that you can bring in that one stream 
from an encoder like Wirecast and then repackage it into all those different formats that we talked about simultaneously and deliver it to thousands, tens of thousands, or using a, 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 a CDN like CloudFront to potentially millions of, of end users uh, at one time and, and hit all those different devices. So using the devices that the end user wants to use to watch the content. And I guess to answer that question as well from the server perspective is, you know, our server software is Java based and can run on Windows, Mac or different iterations of Linux. Um, so from that perspective, I think most of our clients deploy on Linux just because of the, you know, in the cloud, that's where our cloud partners are deploying. Um, but yeah, that kind of answers that question from a operating system or architecture perspective as well. Now, Tom, I have a question here asking, what is the preference? Is it better to develop on or to use Wirecast in PC or on the Mac? Um, it's really uh, pretty much identical software for, for both platforms. Um, we have uh, large groups of customers that use both platforms. For example, um, a lot of gamers uh, streaming their video games are, are only PC users, uh, and they're, they're, they're uh, big PC users of Wirecast. On the other side, we might have a more traditional uh, broadcast audience that uses Mac or um, House of Worship market will will also tend to use Macs, um, so it kind of uh, is is split up. It's it's nearly a 50-50 break uh, with using uh, Windows and Mac. Thanks, Tom. I th we have a lot of questions here regarding 4K, and you know, with the the advent of H.265 and HEVC, you know, you see a lot of people trying to make that production jump. Um, from the production perspective, as well as from the delivery perspective of 4K content. From the 4K side, what are you guys doing at Wirecast to kind of support that going forward, Tom? Uh, from the, well, from the company point, I should start at the company point of view because we, we are uh, part of the, the, uh, the groups that are writing the standards for HEVC. We're, we, we set up the, um, the uh, developer group around that uh, and we, we're very involved in it uh, with our enterprise products, uh, and we demoed a lot of that at NAB uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, 4K for web streaming uh, will come, and it's something that, that uh, we're looking closely at. And also, as I mentioned before, that technology that is uh, nicely developed and matured in our enterprise products makes it into the desktop products. So look for 4K in the future. And I think with a lot of it, it, it just becomes a bandwidth issue, you know, both from the production yes, side as course. well as the delivery yeah. side. And, uh, you know, Chris, what are we doing at Wowza on the 4K side and with HEVC and H.265? Yeah, at CES, the Consumer Electronics Show in January, we showed off our first demo of HEVC uh, streaming with Wowza. Um, and, and also 4K streaming uh, at NEB. And so we're, we're, we are trying both. We have both technologies functional. We have not yet put them out for general use in the product. Uh, just because we're waiting for more customer feedback, uh, we're, we're evaluating all the different possibilities. We want to make sure that when it goes out, it's very robust and meets everybody's needs and expectations. So kind of like uh, Tom and, and the Telestream team, we're, we're looking at what's happening in the market and monitoring it closely and monitoring customer feedback. So if you happen to be listening and you're saying, you know, I have got to have HEVC and or 4K streaming, which, which not necessarily the same, uh, you, you can do that. Uh, please let us know uh, because that will help factor in where that falls on our priority list for implementation, you know, in the next year. And I think you bring up a good point about 4K, just like 1080p, you know, that's the actual resolution, but there is a difference between that and, of course, um, H.264 or different codecs that happen to be at that particular resolution. So that's a good distinction to make. Uh, I, kind of from the deployment side, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, we did d show this, this webinar today out in our AWS instance. So talking about deployment, I have a question here from Joe. And he's saying he likes to use Wowser in more of his productions. Um, his, ev his events often have a few hundred viewers that are spread across the globe. He's concerned with using a single server solution versus CDN and setting up multiple services in different regions seems quite complex. So using Amazon CloudFront doesn't recover from a stream failure. failure. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And I guess maybe provide a little bit more detail on, on the origin edge configuration and what that is for a lot of our newbies who don't know much about the cloud. Yeah. Before, well, before, so we've been providing uh, Amazon machine images uh, for AWS usage for EC2 uh, for a number of years, since 2007, in fact. 
and before there was an AWS CloudFront and before it was uh, simpler to push content into a lot of the other content delivery networks, many folks would and still today set up their own origin edge configuration within cloud instances. So they may have one or two origin servers, one as a primary, one as a backup often, um, set up nearest to the in the in the region regional data center uh, nearest to the encoder so that they have as few hops as possible between encoder and server uh, and then from there put edge servers out on in different regions uh, on EC2 so that you, you're basically building out your own small CDN your own content delivery network using Wowza servers in fact uh, uh, almost half the CDNs in the world have Wowza as part of their infrastructure and some of them have specifically built out their streaming infrastructure using Wowza Origin and Edge servers in just this way. But with HTTP, if you're doing HTTP streaming, which is now much more popular than it was when we all started, and, and we we're mostly focused on things like RTSP and RTMP, HTTP and regular web caching networks that the content delivery networks provide are very robust and allow you to scale infinitely. You don't have to worry about whether or not you have enough servers out at the edge if you're not sure how big your audience is going to be. But in this case, if you know that you have an audience of a fairly fixed size, you know it's just going to be a few hundred people, and you want to make sure that you have um, servers in each of those regions where folks are going to be watching, it is pretty easy to set up separate uh, Wowza streaming engines in each of those regions and then source from a, an origin server and then also have a backup server so that if for any reason you lose the connection to the first server, uh, it rolls over to the second one. So you can do either, it really depends on, uh, and you can do the same too with, with HTTP, you can set it up in such a way uh, with a little programmatic work so that you, you fail over uh, on an HTTP scenario as well. Uh, so you can have a very robust infrastructure either way. Uh, one gives you a little bit more control, uh, one gives you full scalability without having to worry about you know, viral spikes or anything uh, because your content just got picked up by <laughs> somebody and blogged and suddenly you have a million users trying to watch. So right. there, there are pros and cons to each. So just to kind of provide a little bit more detail, I think for a lot of people, any any mention of AWS or the cloud or, you know, people get confused. And something to keep in mind is Amazon EC2 is pretty much the computer instances that you would create and install um, uh, Wows on. And then, of course, you have CloudFront, which is more of a CDN, a content delivery network. And we had a question regarding you know, using RTMP over CloudFront. And that is an issue because that's HTTP um, a CDN. So that you can only leverage CloudFront if you actually deliver over HTTP protocol. So that's exactly what Chris was showing today during the demo. Um, all right, let's let's go ahead and switch switch gears a little bit. I want to talk a little bit more about the production side. And Tom, I have a couple of questions here regarding, you know, one from Mark that says, how does one feed multiple cameras into Wirecast? And then also one from Pessy that says, what are the challenges or problems mixing HD cameras with SD cameras in Wirecast? Um, let, let me take the first one. Uh, the, in terms of, uh, the first one first, in terms of capture cards, uh, uh, bringing video into Wirecast is the solution for that. I mean, we ha we have on our website a list of capture cards that we support and that manufacturers support for bringing in uh, uh, high quality streams into Wirecast. Uh, we we support all the ma major manufacturers such, such as H A J A J A, uh, Blackmagic, um, Avermedia Matrox as a quad card. Uh, and so that, that you know, we, we support quite a few. Um, so you, I would take a look at that list, and and uh, we also have another uh, document on our website in our resources section that'll give you some ideas for sample setups and how uh, everything fits together, uh, whether or not you're using uh, two or three uh, HD cameras, whether you're using uh, a webcam, whether you're using a USB. Uh, connection or a Thunderbolt connection. Uh, what are all of what are all the configurations you need for your computer, for uh, the cameras, the capture cards, uh, and so forth. Uh, somebody did ask a question too. I saw on uh, on the, the chat that uh, can can I bring in USB cameras into uh, Wirecast? And yes, uh, all the major manufacturers, the Logitech, Microsoft, or products that I've been using here, uh, the Apple FaceTime camera. Uh, and that, that that actually 
produces a very nice high quality uh, video. So um, there, are, there are lots of lots of options out there. Uh, the second question, uh, the the challenge of bringing both HD and SD uh, cameras into Wirecast uh, could be solved through uh, basically through the capture cards and um, just all right um, Actually, I'll turn. I'm going to turn this over to our technical specialist, uh, who's, who's sitting next to me, because I, I don't have a uh, a great technical answer for that. But Andrew does. Andrew Haley's our our technical specialist. Hello out there. Um, so, yes, Tom. Thanks for turning this over to me. Um, I'd be happy to answer that. Uh, it can. You know, there's different ways to handle different size sources. Um, ultimately, it's going to come down to um, sort of a mix and match approach. Uh, different capture cards will have uh, different drivers and inputs available for different um, resolutions and sources um, and connections. So, um, however you decide to get the sources, whether you know if you have SD capture card and it mixed with an HD capture card or an HD source, you'll need to bring those into Wirecast. Wirecast can handle all those just fine, all the way up to a uh, 1920 by 1080 um, HD size um, uh, video source. And then it's going to be up to you on whether you want to crop the sources, whether you want to resize or um, uh, scale the sources up res or down res, whether you want to make your smaller sources match the larger canvas size for the HD output or whether you want to scale down your HD outputs down to a standard def size. Um, the nice thing about Wirecast is that it can easily output um, different, uh, different resolutions into different streams. So if you want to send an HD stream out um, at 1920 or uh, 1280, um, you can do that. Um, and then uh, if you also want to simultaneously uh, down res and send out a standard def, you can do that as well. Um, so yeah, there's there's lots of ways to solve that. But it's, you know, either way, you're probably going to see some letterboxing or some pillar boxing or um, uh, some, some scaling um, going on. Perfect. Thanks, Andrew. And like Andrew mentioned, it becomes more of a kind of an aspect ratio issue. You know, if you're bringing in content that's scaled to four by three as opposed to 16 by nine, you have to make those decisions on the production production side of things. So thanks for that clarification. Um, Chris, I have a question here from Paul that says, are there any plans to enable WASA to ingest HTTP streams? We do get that request once in a while. We currently don't have any plans to, to enable that. Uh, if there are specific use cases that, that you have, Paul, that, that you'd like to ask us about, please do reach out afterwards. Uh, just send a uh, mail to support at wowza.com, and uh, we'd, we'd love to better understand what it is you're trying to accomplish and if we can help you do so. And I have a, another question here from, from Vitor. Um, he asked, do you need to re-encode the media at the Wowza streaming engine, or could this be done directly? And I think this question um, kind of pertains to a question that we get often, and this is where our transcoder add-on really adds a lot of functionality on the Wowza side, that we can ingest one stream, and then if you have the transcoder add-on enabled, you can actually take care of retranscoding that. Do you want to provide a little bit more detail on that, Chris? I'm going to ask you to reword the question a little bit. <laughs> if you would, just restate it. Definitely. Well, I guess what we're asking here is about sending in one encoded stream into Wowza and having Wowza take care of retranscoding that into different streams. Did we lose you, Chris? Oh, sorry. I was on mute. Uh, yeah, so a lot of folks will... Um, will have uh, you know enough bandwidth to get one good stream up to to a Wowza streaming engine from their encoder. Uh, otherwise, they might let the encoder do this. Uh, but if but if they only have enough for the one or or the Wowza streaming engine is somewhere offsite and they only want to send the one stream, uh, they can do that. And then you can you as I mentioned earlier, you can transcode it if it happens to be not coming from Wirecast and therefore is not coming in say an H.264 and AAC. Uh, you could transcode it into those codecs. Uh, so that you get sort of that universal distribution capability. Um, 
And then the transcoder add-on can additionally do trans rating, so that, that creates multiple streams, or multiple versions of your single HD stream at lower quality levels, so that as bandwidth fluctuates, uh, the player will select lower or higher bitrate streams, lower or higher qualities, effectively, uh, to adjust to the bandwidth and CPU demands that are happening on their device. Uh, and, and then because Wowza does all of the packetization, not as part of the transcoding, just, just as part of its, its core code, it'll repackage those, uh, you know, all those streams coming out at multiple bit rates into multiple different flavors, if you will, or multiple different streaming formats so that we can hit all those end devices. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. I think that covers, yeah, I think that covers the functionality of that transcoder. Um, we have another question here from David okay. that says, "Are any oh, which adaptive bitrate protocols are compatible with iOS?" And I think that's probably a question for you, Chris. Sorry, it, it got a little jumbled there. A little sorry. Which formats yeah, are which, compatible with each other? Uh, yeah, which adaptive bitrate protocols are compatible with iOS? Oh, sorry. Got it. Okay. Uh, the, today, the only ones th that work with the native iOS playback capabilities are uh, are HTTP live streaming because that's the format that Apple came up with. However, there are um, players that have been made um, that sometimes you can find uh, typically from player providers or from third parties, you know, who are providing lots of great content. Think of your favorite favorite on-demand content provider. Uh, perhaps, and it'll have an app that will play not only HLS content, but it will also play back sometimes in smooth streaming. Uh, and, and the advantage to them doing that is it allows them to put on studio grade uh, DRM protection in the form of PlayReady, typically, Microsoft PlayReady. Uh, so there are some players out there that will allow you to play back as smooth streaming, and there are newer ones coming out which allow you to play with MPEG Dash. There isn't, a, I don't think, a set of consistent players yet that do this or rather I should say a set of players that do this consistently yet. That's one of the things that is still sort of gelling in the market. Um, but if you want to make sure to hit an iOS device, use HLS. Uh, if you have a player that you know will play uh, uh, on a different format, then you could also use that as well. They're just not nearly as popular as just the built-in capabilities which require HLS. Thanks, Chris. And we have run over our time, so I think I'm going to go ahead and bring proceedings to a close. We have a lot of questions still pending, but we're going to follow up with all of you individually via email within the next few days after the webinar. I think the final question I'll address is maybe on the player side, is we have a question here talking about JW Player, since that's the player that we featured in today's webinar. And the idea here is, you know, it's a question from Roni. Um, his example showed HLS streaming, but if you wanted to use HDS or Microsoft Smooth or another protocol, do you have to have a different player for each streaming? Um, and really the idea there is you would control that on your website um, through the player. So you could pull, push all of those different protocols into your player and have your player control that. Um, the JavaScript on your website will actually decide which player to show for what device. So that's definitely more of a player question. And we did have a JW player webinar last, last month where we talked a little bit more about that side of things. So I encourage you to view that on demand. But I really want to take this chance to, to thanks Tom Preen from, from Telestream. And thanks, Andrew Haley, as well. Thank you guys for, for helping us with today's webinar. Sure, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. It was good. And Chris, I really appreciate your time being on here. And like I mentioned to all of you, we have recorded today's session. We'll be sending that archive out here within the next couple of days. So look for that in your email. So thanks a lot, Chris. Yep, you're welcome. All right, and thanks to all of you for attending. And we'll keep the webinar open for a few more minutes so you can copy out the information. But Look for that follow-up email here in the next couple of days. Thanks again.